This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 98, recorded September 10th, 2010. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is TWIV, your weekly podcast about viruses. Joining me today from Western Massachusetts is Alan Dove. Good to be here. Welcome back, or I yeah. should say, I'm back, right? Yeah, we're we're all back we're together all back. again. And from uh, South North Central Florida. There you go. Gosh, I don't know why I'm confusing it. Rich Condit. Hello. How you doing, Rich? Uh, Alan and Vincent. Good to see you. We're in Syria, whatever you know. I'm fine. It's great did to you, be back. Did you take a little? Uh, break rich uh you know i had sort of sporadic breaks uh, throughout the summer associated you know sort of tail on meetings that kind of stuff and then we yeah. actually went to texas and helped my daughter move and so yeah little bits of time here and there but cool. i'm back we're teaching doing the whole thing yeah it's september yeah and can you believe it we're at episode 98 terrific it's amazing yeah it's really uh pushing it on what happens after 100 should we just stop no, <laughs> just, <laughs> no. It's kind just of keep on going. There's no other number that will approach it for a long time, right? Uh, well, a thousand. Yeah, a thousand. That'll be a long time. A long we could time. celebrate every prime number that comes around. Does 101 qualify? I have a friend who's really crazy <laughs> about prime That'd numbers. Be good. You know? Prime is an interesting <laughs> concept. Yes. Well, anyway, uh, I guess we, it's been two years, roughly, since we started, so that's pretty good. We're coming on 100, and we're hoping to have a, an interesting special episode. Stay tuned. And it's amazing that it's uh, co coinciding. We're going to have a special guest, I hope, and uh, it's coinciding with episode 100, so stay tuned. Today we have our usual selection of virology stories, so let's get into that. The first one is a paper in PNAS that was withheld from publication, oh, I think, uh, this summer, about two months ago. It's from Harvey Alter and his group uh, at the Food and Drug Administration, the National Institutes of Health, collaborator at Harvard Medical School, and it is entitled Detection of MLV-Related Virus Gene Sequences in the Blood of Patients with Chronic Fatigue Syndrome and Healthy blood donors. So this is a study in which patient, the blood of patients with chronic fatigue syndrome was assayed by uh, several different assays, which we'll, we'll talk about, for the presence of XMRV, the virus that has been associated with prostate cancer and chronic fatigue syndrome. And this is a study of American patients. In fact, these patients were studied, I believe, in the early 1990s as part of a study to determine if mycoplasma were involved uh, in chronic fatigue syndrome. And there were a total of... Uh, 101 patients. Total 37 CFS patients, 44 healthy controls. Right. Previous study had 101 patients. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, so they used 37 yeah. of those. The interesting thing about this, and they were classified by CDC criteria of uh, two different types. Each of the patients met the 1988 CDC criteria for CFS, and 21 also met the 1994 CDC criteria. Now, some of these were in an academic medical center, and others were referred by private practices. And for those, the criteria for CFS are, are not as well known as for the academic patients. The interesting thing about this sample set, and by the way, these are mostly from New England and not any patient that has been in any other study, apparently. So none of the WPI patients are in this study. And interestingly, none of the WPI control, uh, in other words, the positive samples for WPI, those are not used in this study either. But, but the interesting thing is that they have some repeat samples. So they have uh, four samples where they uh, they got a second sample two years later after the original in the early 90s. And then they had eight samples taken this year, 2010, which would be 15 years later. Okay, 
So that's they don't they don't comment on whether those people fifteen years later are still suffering from the disease, do they? I didn't see that anywhere. I didn't see it, but I presume they are. Right. Okay. There. I mean, it, it can it can resolve or it can continue. So that is that's a a good question. Yeah. If someone knows, let us know. So then they did PCR, two kinds of PCR, looking for proviral DNA. So you extract. DNA from PBMCs, blood mononuclear cells, and then you look for integrated viral DNA. And then a second assay, you extract RNA from plasma and look for viral RNA by RT-PCR. What the results are is that 32 of 37 CFS samples, 86.5% are positive uh, by the assay looking for proviral DNA. 86.5%. Looking for viral RNA in plasma, uh, the number is 42%, I believe. Yes, it's 42% positive, so less. Not as easy to detect uh, virus RNA. Uh, but the repeat testing uh, results are interesting. So the two-year sample, the four uh, samples where they got another sample two years later, all four remained positive for proviral DNA. And the 15-year repeat, those are eight of those, seven of those remained positive. So that virus is in those seven of eight patients for 15 years. Right. Yes. Actually, this was, this was also mentioned in a really good uh, science uh, magazine story. Um, that was reported on this when the paper came out as well. Mm -hmm. um, that yeah, they uh, the reason they did the follow up um, was actually because of the delay or vice versa. Um, so this paper was delayed because we had conflicting data coming from the CDC. Um, the HHS, which is the umbrella agency in charge of both of these groups, said, you know, hey, let's get our story straight figure out what's going yeah. on. Um, and the CDC paper came out first. Um, and meanwhile, these folks, uh, it may be that part of the delay was that Alter and his colleagues went back and decided to really nail things down. And this was one of the things that they did during that time, apparently. Mm. So they got repeat samples and looked at those. Yeah. Right. So that's, in my view, that's very interesting. That means that this is a long-term virus infection, which is consistent with a chronic disease. Well, and you would kind of expect it to be that way if it's really an integrated proviral DNA. Yes, you would expect it to stick around. Well, it depends on the cell, right? I suppose, yeah. Because if it's a long-lived cell, the proviral DNA will stick right. around. If not, so if it, you know, uh, I suppose this implies that it's in some sort of stem cell, right, or a, a long-lived uh, lymphocyte population. Because right. remember, right. these are PBMCs. It's a very specific set of cells. So yes, it could be a stem cell or a long-lived lymphocyte. You know, the, the same question or getting, Are you seeing multiple integration events where it's infecting one cell and before that cell dies, it manages to infect another and integrate? Sure. I suppose. Yeah. Sure. In that sense, I wonder, they don't mention whether they looked for viral RNA in the repeat samples, do they? They just give a percentage. Right. So no, there's I, one exception, all the mm, and that's something else. Yeah. So that would be interesting to know if the virus is around for 15 years, right? Right. And I don't think we can get that from the data in this paper. No. So they looked also at 44 healthy controls, and three of those, which is 6.8%, were positive. So the virus is in healthy people as well. They did a lot of, of control experiments here to make sure this wasn't a false positive. They sequenced all the PCR products to prove that this is um, a viral RNA or DNA as expected. And they also looked for murine mitochondrial DNA in all the samples make sure they hadn't been contaminated with mouse samples. Yeah, this is a really, really good study. It is. It is. It's very well done. I'm very impressed with it. Yeah, yeah they, they spent a lot of time discussing uh, what what the appropriate controls are to eliminate contamination and stuff. And right. they have pretty rigorous arguments uh, to rule out a lot of the artifactual possibilities for the results. Now, what really is interesting here, I mean, besides the finding of uh, this virus in a good fraction of CFS patients is the fact that it's not really, or it doesn't look to be XMRV. Right. It looks, so XMRV is related to a xenotropic murine leukemia virus. That is a mouse virus that doesn't infect mice, but 
infects other species, other mammalian species. The viruses found in this study are not xenotropic. They are what's called polytropic murine leukemia viruses. That is, they infect both mice and other species. And now since this, you just blogged about another paper like this, right? Or did, was that the same? That's this paper. In the, okay, in that the, was what you just blogged yeah, about. Yeah, and a commentary that was also in the same issue of, right. of PNAS. Right. Now, these viruses are very similar. So they're 96.6% uh, nucleotide identity. So they're very similar viruses, but they clearly have somewhat different origins. So one, the XMRV is a xenotropic, and the ones in this study, which I call PMRV, I guess, polytropic murine leukemia yeah, virus, would. like right. virus or related viruses, would are are these. And there there are a lot of interesting details, and I would refer people to the commentary in PNAS. Um, not all the sequence, the, the sequence of the entire genome of the ALTER study hasn't been done yet. So that needs to be done to really confirm the origin, I think, of these viruses. But you can see that by a number of criteria, XMRV and the PMRVs are different viruses. They're both mouse viruses. They're both, both mouse retroviruses, but they have distinct origins. And what, right. I, what I find very interesting is that, so they talk in the, in the commentary about, there's a very interesting protein in um, these murine retroviruses called glycogag. I don't know if you guys have ever encountered no, glycogag. No, you can explain. You can explain this to yeah, me. Yeah, this was a new one on me. Right. Rich, you've heard about glycogag. Uh, no. Yes, actually. yes. You and I were at I a have? recent. At, we were at a recent meeting together, Rich. <laughs> uh, it was in San Francisco. Okay. Okay. And we ah, heard yes. about it. Okay. <laughs> Can't mention it. So uh, the main structural protein of these murine retroviruses is, is protein called gag which is processed to form a variety of proteins, including the core of the particle. And the GAG protein is initiated at an AUG codon on the viral RNA. Upstream of that AUG codon, there's a second codon in frame. It's a CTG. It's not an AUG. And it is also initiated. It's translated. And the consequence is you make a slightly longer protein that becomes embedded in the membrane of the cell and becomes a secreted protein such that it becomes glycosylated. So it gets, goes through the endoplasmic reticulum in the Golgi and goes up to the surface and gets incorporated into the membrane of the virus, okay, like the envelope protein. Right. So normally GAG is the internal core of the, protein, of the virus, but glycogag gets put on the membrane. And apparently this is an important protein. If you take it away, the virus is less infectious and less pathogenic. So there are differences in the glycogag of XMRV and polytropic MLVs and the viruses in this paper. In particular, the XMRVs, all the ones described to date, have a 24-base in-frame deletion in glycogag. And polytropic murine leukemia viruses and the alter viruses have a 9-base deletion. Okay, so they're clearly very different from XMRV. They all make, they all likely make glycogag, but they're different. They have polymorphisms, let's say, that show the origin of the virus. Right. right. And this explains some of the confusion and debate that surrounded this paper when it came out. That uh, some people said, well, this confirms the earlier WPI result, and other people, um, including me, say this doesn't exactly confirm it because it's not the same virus. Yeah, it's not but the it's same very virus. Similar. It's a very similar virus. It shows to me, it shows that marine uh, leukemia like viruses. Uh, of polytropic and xenotropic origins can infect people in North America. And it really, to me, um, it's entirely consistent with uh, something that we've talked about before, which is the idea that this could be an opportunistic infection. Could be. Um, and, and if that were the case, you would fully expect it to be somewhat diverse if people are getting this mouse virus in various settings. Um, and people who are fully immunocompetent just get rid of it, and people who have some kind of inflammation or some kind of uh, you know, depression of their immune system end up getting a chronic infection. Yeah. With it. I, and it's, I, it's I, interesting that, I don't know if this, I think this was in the commentary, uh, going back to something that we discussed before. In the commentary, they even suggest that one way to prove causality 
is to uh, do, I guess you'd call them experiments, where uh, you try and cure the virus infection with antivirals and right. see if the patients recover. Exactly. Right. Yeah, they mentioned the example with Helicobacter pylori. Yes. Where the causation with respect to ulcers wasn't proven until he treated people with antibiotics, got rid of the, of the bacterium, and got rid of their ulcers. Right. So right. the commentary is, yes, let's treat people with antivirals and see if they get better. Well, there's also very... is that you could do that, but right. you'd have to be you'd you'd have to take some considerable care in designing such a study. Right. There's a there's yeah. a significant risk benefit analysis that has to go on. And it right. sh and it needs to be done in a very carefully controlled way with a clearly defined population. Right. So this has to be a real clinical trial. It can't be casual use of antiretrovirals. And you'd also have to do um I mean because of the of the uncertainty about the causality of this condition in the first place, you'd have to do things like active placebos. Yes. Uh, you know, if you, uh, and to explain that concept, what happens is if you give, if you give a drug in a clinical trial, um, many times you'll see a certain amount of placebo effect. Mm -hmm. And in order to control for that, you give other people placebo. But if your active drug that you're testing has side effects that people know about, then they're going to know whether they're on placebo or on drug or on mm. uh, drug. Yeah. Um, and so you'll get an apparent effect, but it's actually just um, that people know that they're on the placebo, so they don't respond to the placebo effect. So there's a, there's a, um, wow. there's a complication to that with a disease like this. I, I would actually think um, prostate cancer might be an easier condition in which to study this, although in that case, you often at least with the XMRV studies that have been done so far, you're dealing with patients who are so sick that you may not be able to follow up with them very long. Right. Yeah, it's a difficult clinical trial because the assumption is that the patients will, the CFS patients will get better, right? That, right. Would, that would be the positive result you would want. But we don't know if, if in fact, let's say XMRV and PMRV do cause CFS. We don't know if treating with an antiviral will uh, clear the infection and make you better. Right. It could be and that the integrated provirus is what's causing disease. Right. And it's pr it's almost certainly naive to think that there is a single nice, neat viral cause for such a complex condition. Yeah, I, th uh, I think the authors of this paper uh, discuss that as well. Right. Yeah. Um, so the, the commentary does suggest that an antiviral clinical trial would be good, and they also say we should do uh, some extensive case control studies in North America to see who has these various viruses and who doesn't. Yeah, it's also interesting to me to see that these studies seem to be, um, now we're still dealing with relatively small numbers of studies and small numbers of patients, but so far um, the studies seem to fall into two categories. There are the ones that find um, that find murine-like viruses, or, P, or whether XMRV or, or PMRV, um, but these, these very similar viruses in the patient population that they're looking at and also in some percentage of healthy controls. And then there are the negative studies that are zero, zero. Yeah. They don't find it in the patients and they don't find it in the controls. Um, and to me, that seems kind of weird. Well, you know, now that we know there's more than one type of virus, it could be that the primers in the other studies were simply not detecting PMRV, say. Exactly. Yeah, I think there's a lot of technical stuff here that needs to be sorted out to get this done right. Right. Zero is seldom the right answer in a biological yeah. assay. So I think a lot of those negative studies, they ought to go back and make primers from the ALTER study and see if they can pick up PMRV. Right. Because I'll bet that explains the zero, zero. Right. So if right. I understood the commentary, uh, the commentary correctly, they were suggesting actually uh, a broader study that's not just looking at CS, uh, CFS, but looking at the total distribution of these viruses in the human population. Uh, well, what they what they were suggested was use coded control samples from subjects with inflammatory disease yes. to determine the frequency of MLV infection in patients with CFS. Which is something okay. I think we've, uh, at least I've mentioned on TWIV, um, that you ought to look in other diseases. Right. Because it's really, the other thing that's, and this to me is kind of freakish, is as far as I know, the only two conditions where people have bothered to look for these viruses are prostate cancer and CFS, 
Um, they're completely unrelated conditions. And it, the virus showed up. Um, that's just a bizarre stroke of luck, or, um, <laughs> or well, is this? They have looked for it in another, it was a French study, which uh, ex is um, escaping me at the moment, but I will look it up. Uh, it was just published recently where they looked for um, the involvement of S XMRV and didn't find it. Let me see. I'll try and Google it very quickly. Okay, pa pediatric idiopathic diseases in France. So okay. Pa paper in retrovirology in August. No evidence for XMRV association in pediatric, pediatric idiopathic diseases in France. But again, you could argue that the PCR primers weren't uh, appropriate to pick right. up uh, all M MLVs. So should probably be redone. Yeah, Idiopath, I, idiopathic, by the way, is a fancy doctor word for we don't understand it. We don't know what causes <laughs> it. We don't know what causes it. Thank Unknown you. cause. Very yeah. good. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, it's, I, I really think that someone needs to go or several someones need to go and look at this in, uh, you know, in an inflammatory disease, maybe in transplant patients, maybe in HIV patients, and, and look at as many different populations with different immune problems as you can. Right. And if this is an opportunistic um, situation where you've got these murine viruses coming in when the immune system takes a powder, um, then you'd expect to see it in multiple conditions. Right. Yep. I personally, I think this study is now will now allow case control epidemiology to go forward. Yeah, this is a this is a really uh, pretty clear. You know, yes. I, I think uh, we needed study. a second independent yeah. confirmation. In, yeah. at least in North America. Exactly. One thing I like about this is that he uh, they use the um, the fact that there's variation in the viruses as part of their control for artifacts. Right. Okay, they say that. If this were contamination, we wouldn't have come up with four distinct new viruses, okay, because nobody's ever seen these before. And secondly, if it were contamination, you wouldn't expect that looking at the same patient 15 years later with a new sample, you would find that they had the same virus that they did 15 years ago. Okay? Right. So that, that, that's really pretty cool. Yeah, that's very cool. So one more thing, let me clarify. Um, I had said that XMRV is a xenotropic virus, and the, the viruses from this study are polytropic. XMRV is actually a recombinant. Okay, it's a recombinant virus. It has the five prime half of the genome from polytropic MLVs, and the three prime half encoding the envelope from xenotropic MLVs. Whereas the low virus doesn't seem to be a recombinant. Okay. I have a little trouble with this term xenotropic. Uh, I mean, a mouse virus that doesn't infect mice doesn't make any sense to me. That sounds like a non sequitur. Well, you, you know, the mice, that? the mice that make it have developed resistance. They're not; their tissues aren't reinfected. So it's an endogenous virus for them, exactly. and they make it, but it can't reinfect them. Boy. Exactly. So it, you know, you. we I think we talked about this before. Probably at one point in history, long time ago, it did infect them, but strains evolved that lost the receptor and they don't become reinfected so these Weird. these mice shed the virus it infects other animals. i guess i you know i guess that, yeah sure i guess that makes sense why not you're stuck with it because it's a pro virus all right but you don't you don't yeah, want to get yeah. hurt anymore so you develop resistance to yeah, it Yeah, exactly so if, if it's a harmful virus the survivors are selected for right okay okay one last cool thing about this that i didn't realize so they compared the glyco the glycogag sequence of these viruses. This is this kind of blows me away. Here's this here's the conclusion: the glycogag leader of XMRV is a hundred percent match with a one two nine laboratory mouse strain. One hundred percent with a lab mouse, and the glycogag of the current the alter sequence matches C fifty seven black. Mice, 99%. Hmm. Hmm. Now, I don't know how different wild mice are, but I bet they are different, more different than 100%. Right? They don't have 100% identity with glycogag. So does this mean the origin were, was laboratory infections? Whoa. Hmm. Or the, the, the lab, I, I don't know. The, maybe the virus is the same in wild mice as in lab mice. It seems unlikely to me. 
Well, like, that ought to spawn a whole bunch of research in that direction. Yeah, you see what I'm saying, right? right I don't, yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, maybe the glycogag is too short to make any determinations. I don't know, but I thought that was quite interesting. And that, I is, I, that is mighty odd. I had missed that in reading. Now, now Steve, yeah, Go Steve Goff too. has told me that you know most of the work on these murine viruses is done, in fact, with laboratory strains of mice. So maybe people just haven't looked enough. Maybe there are very similar viruses out right. there in wild you need mice. need to go out and get a bunch of wild mice. Hey, right. I wonder who's doing that. Ah. <laughs> now you got another project, Vincent. Yeah. Well, I got enough to handle, but people want samples. They can have them. Steve. Give them to Steve. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. He might want them. Okay. Is that enough on that, guys? Yeah, sure. That was great. All right. The uh, next story is a very brief one, which I thought we should talk about. It's a... Uh, it's a Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report in August, and it's called Completion of National Laboratory Inventories for Wild Poliovirus Containment Region of the Americas. And now Alan will, will love this. Uh, a couple of years ago, CDC sent out questionnaires asking, do you have any poliovirus in your lab? The reason why, of course, is that if polio is ever eradicated, they want anyone, they want to know where there are stocks of polio virus and they want to get them destroyed eventually. So I remember getting a questionnaire and uh, this is the result of that questionnaire. And they have all the countries in the Americas here from Argentina through Venezuela. Um, the number of facilities that were queried in each country and basically, uh, the number of facilities retaining wild poliovirus materials. And by far, who do you think is the highest number? It's an amazing number. United States, 180 facilities retaining wild-type polio. And one of those 180, of course, is my laboratory right here <laughs> in New York. Well, so I'm a statistic. <laughs> yes. Well, we all are anyway, right? But most countries have just five or eight or one or two, and some have none. So the vast majority is, is supposedly in the U.S. Now, this could be wrong, of course, right? Yeah. Now, what are the odds that somebody might have a mislabeled vial in a freezer somewhere? Well, well there you go. That's part of the problem. Pretty right? high. I yeah. Would in think. fact, I believe that has been documented. And also, there are many uh, facilities that have clinical samples stored for various reasons, which may have polio in them, but they might not know it. Yep. And those are at risk also. So, you know, this this is the low hanging fruit, right? Right. The easy This is stuff. just finding out who has virus. Yeah. Who has who has known um right. samples of the of the virus. Right. I, it I mean, any pediatric stool sample taken in the last fifty years is potentially yeah, gonna exactly, have it. Exactly, exactly. I mean and this is wild poliovirus, of course. Right. I don't know if they separate. I don't remember if they separately ask about the vaccine strains, but there might even be more. But anyway, this is kind of a unique uh, situation. I don't think we've done this. Rich, was this done for smallpox, or did we know where smallpox was? Ah, uh, wow! Good it question. must have been done for smallpox, uh, but uh, certainly nobody ever inquired of me. Um, I think, I think they probably knew of. Well, no, they must have done something like this because I remember a lot of questions going around about who might have it where. So there must have been some sort of survey. I don't, I don't recall anything uh, specifically coming out of it, but I'm, I'm, I'm sure it was done yeah, because yeah. they do now say, you know, it only exists, at least known, in two places in the world. And I think other laboratories where they knew they had smallpox, they, they got rid of it. Yeah. Known. That's the uh, yeah, key word. Known. known. Right. And it's important to remember that with smallpox, that was happening during the Cold War. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, in fact, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, um, there have subsequently been discoveries of stocks of smallpox that were scattered about in various republics um, that were not generally known in the West. Mm -hmm. So. So this is just this is just who has it. Right, Vincent? Who admitted to having it. Who, who right. admitted to having it. <laughs> okay. So. Yeah. I mean, what, I said, yeah. I, that, I mean, you got to catalog all this stuff, right? Yeah, I know what I have. And I mean, the expectation is one day if polio is eradicated and there's no more left on the globe, they'll say destroy it. Hmm. And who okay. knows when that's going to happen? I mean, so let's say I retire in uh, 10 years, right? 
what do I do? Do I destroy it all? Do I leave it behind? If I leave it behind, you know, no one else is really going to know what it is. And yeah. what do you do with all of the substrains that you worked on? I guess I have to destroy it all. Yeah, because then, I mean, that's that gets into a whole research archiving issue as well. Or I could send it to someone who works on polio and let them Let them store it. it. Yeah. Yeah. But so, I, but there's not, there's not so far been some sort of rigorous uh, uh, cataloging effort or anything like that, no. like they do with Class A agents. No, they just said yes or no. Do you have po wild polio materials? Okay. Yes or no. Yeah. Fine. And, you know, I've been asked to put a lock on my freezer. That's about it. Okay. Because I know, you know, if you work with a Class A agent, smallpox or uh, I don't know some of the. Uh, uh, arboviruses, um, the cataloging and accounting for these things yes. is phenomenal. Right. It's really amazing. Yeah, we have some people here that do that. you got to know where yeah. every last microliter is. Yeah, no, no. Some people are surprised, actually, that I don't have to, but nothing has been said so far. So we'll see. I don't know how far off this is, if it ever it will happen, that polio is eradicated. You know, we have our doubts, as we've talked about here, but this is an interesting step. So mm -hmm. I thought it was worth looking at. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Moving on to Alan, who found that the military wants viral batteries. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so this is a story um, we covered. I, I searched in the archives. It was way, way back on TWIV 28. Wow. You know, I couldn't find it. Good for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, Google Docs uh, you know, regurgitated this right off. Um, oh, that's a I good, forget idea. What, good idea. What terms I popped in, but... Um, um, yeah, so this is something we talked ba about back then. I, I won't review the whole program. If you want to go back to TWIV 28, you can uh, hear about these. But the essential idea is um, that in building a battery, um, such as a lithium battery, you can get better capacity and uh, you know better characteristics by having, I gather the issue is surface area. Uh, so if you have smaller components, um, in the electrodes making a, that are that are in the electrolyte, um, you get better performance. The problem is, as you get smaller and smaller in building these components, they're harder and harder to build. So um, these folks at MIT came up with this technique, which I think is very clever. They use M13 bacteriophage, and they have um, they have essentially decorated the or modified the um, coat protein of the phage. So that it will stick to their um, their nanomolecules, um, so that when the phage assembles, you can then use that as a scaffold to assemble your your uh, anode or cathode for the battery. And these are filamentous phage. That's right. right. These are these are fil M13 is a filamentous phage, so it forms a um, it forms a stick, uh, which is exactly what you want for an electrode. Um, and it's a very small stick. Um, it's, uh, gosh, I just misplaced the size of it, but it's, uh, it's, you know, it's a virus. It's a small virus. Um, so the virus does the construction work for you. Uh, it puts itself together. It self-assembles this coat. And um, then by, by having modified the coat protein, this allows them to, to use the virus coat as a template for laying down the cathodes and anodes of these batteries. Um, so that in itself is really cool. And now they have, um, this was just a conference abstract, so very preliminary work, but uh, I think it's kind of cool. Um, they've taken this to the point where they they have it apparently working well enough that they're looking at making um, thin film batteries. And the cool thing about a thin film um, is that you could potentially put it into something like clothing. So the idea here is that you could have troops in the battlefield and instead of carrying 10 pounds of bulky batteries around in, in pouches and pockets and having to plug everything in, um, they just have maybe in their, in their flak jacket or their BDU, you know, their uniform shirt or whatever, it would just be a battery. Wow. It would be woven in, made out of these uh, M13 bacteriophage um, with the, uh, with the uh, cathodes and anodes templated onto them. Um, and there are, there are obviously some major, major engineering problems that come up with this. Uh, one of the issues with lithium batteries is that they, um, using current technology, they can spontaneously combust sometimes. Um, so you certainly wouldn't want that in clothing. <laughs> um, certainly not if you're in the army. 
Um, but uh, that's that's also an advantage of using the the phage as a template is that you could potentially get reduce the amount of heat generated by the battery, reduce the flammability risk. Um, so it was just it was encouraging to see that they're still pursuing this. A lot of the time, you'll see some um, proof of concept study where somebody does a very interesting thing and and then just you know doesn't get back to it. Um, it just yeah, sucks. it'll be very interesting to see where this goes. I was I was entertained by the information that typical soldiers carry several pounds of batteries. I yeah. guess that makes sense. I never thought about it, but yeah, well, uh, a modern a modern soldier they've got their GPS, they've got their night vision, they've got their uh, you know separate night vision on a scope, they've you know radios and right. this sort of stuff, and and a lot of that stuff I I would assume takes independent batteries. Um. Mm -hmm. So you've got people walking around in in deserts or jungles and carrying all this battery weight. Anything you could do to reduce that would probably be a good idea. So who do you think um, started this idea? So uh, Angela Belcher is the MIT scientist who developed the M13 batteries. Do you think she thought, hmm, this would be a good military application and, hmm, I could get money to do this. Where do you think the military approached her? I think she was probably working on this. I I haven't talked to her, but she was probably working on this as an interesting thing um, and then was approached by the military. That's the way these sorts of things often hmm. happen. But it, it's also possible. I know DOD uh, through ARPA, um, that sort of program, uh, they do actively put out these challenges where they say, you know, hmm. look, we've got this problem with batteries. Can anybody help? And then... Um, then folks will sign up to do it. So I'm not sure which way the yeah, I think it's great. And I also see at this uh, on this uh, Eureka article could have applications for us as well. Oh, of course, right? yeah. If you improve battery performance, I mean that's your laptop and your iPod and your cell phone and all that sort of thing, and potentially even uh, your car. And then you'd really have viruses in your laptops. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Real viruses. That's I right. I can't wait. But you could commit battery on them. <laughs> you could commit battery on them. Excellent. Okay, cool story. And finally, uh, Rich Condit has been studying for medical school lectures yeah. and found a cool study on rabies. So, uh, yeah, as a prologue for this, I would say, first of all, that so I'm... Is that fair to say that you're studying for your lectures? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm I'm revising my lectures for the uh, uh, medical class. We, uh, me, uh, Dave Bloom and I, uh, teach the virology portion to second year medical students together, and that all happens in a just a blizzard over the next couple of weeks. My lectures are over like uh, in, in a week or a week and a half, something like that. It's really concentrated. So I've been sort of revising and upgrading them, I and I like to stick in some sort of little clinical scenario for the medical students because they love that kind of stuff. And frankly, I do too. So I was just sort of, I've got, I do a lecture on rabies. So I was sort of cruising around looking for a rabies case. And I ran across this one in uh, MMWR, Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report from the CDC, which, which I'll describe. Um, I want to uh, start out by reminding everybody that uh, rabies is, first of all, a uh, Single-stranded RNA virus, negative strand, it's an enveloped virus. Appropriately, it's bullet-shaped. I mean, literally <laughs> bullet-shaped. It's, um, uh, there's basically one, essentially, effectively, one serotype uh, that's predominant uh, in infections of humans that circulates in a lot of other, uh, both wild and depending on the circumstances, domestic animals as well, foxes, raccoons, skunks, dogs, uh, and it's transmitted by bites. So, uh, you get bitten by a rabid dog and the virus, uh, replicates locally and then infects neurons, travels through the neurons, ultimately gets to your brain, uh, and uh, kills you from uh, neurological uh, symptoms, ultimately. Um, it's uh, almost 100% fatal. By the, time, if, by the time you present with symptoms, you've, uh, the virus infection is advanced enough so that uh, your uh, chances of recovery are virtually nil. Um, oh, yeah, and during the replication, it also 
winds up showing up in saliva. So that's why uh, the bite of an animal uh, transmits the disease. It's also uh, one of the few, if not the only viruses where there's a, a, an appropriate treatment is post-exposure prophylaxis. So there's a vaccine and there's also hyperimmune uh, uh, gamma globulin. So if you are bitten by a rabid animal, the incubation period is quite long. It's an asymptomatic incubation period, but it can be months or uh, even up to a year long, depending on the, on the circumstances. And so if you go in right away and inject the uh, wound with gamma globulin and then administer this vaccine in a uh, f a sequence of four injections, you can uh, prevent progression of the disease. But once you got symptoms, you're cooked. It's already uh, progressed too far. At any rate. Good job. You're ready for the medical. I'm experience. ready for the, you bet. So this is cool. Um, well. No, uh, right. This, out, this oh, is, yeah. yeah this Somebody is interesting. died. Yeah. Somebody died. Um, and a lot of people were, uh, were hurt. But it's a very interesting uh very interesting case. So let me, uh, I'm going to read some of the case report. I'll try and summarize where I can. Uh, October 5th, 2009, a previously healthy man from Indiana, aged 43 years, visited uh, an employee health clinic with fever and cough. So that's his first complaint. Vital signs and physical examination, unremarkable except for uh, uh, some lung sounds. Um, the uh, clinician made the diagnosis of bronchitis, prescribed, prescribed an antibiotics, told him to come back the next day. Uh, Follow-up appointment, this is the next day. Worsening fever and chills, new chest pain, and left arm numbness. Uh-oh, now we got uh, central nervous system, CNS symptoms. Not recognized as such uh, immediately. Decreased grip in his left hand. So this is looking like uh, maybe a heart attack. Right. Mm, so they right. do an EKG, don't find any evidence for a heart attack, gives him uh, narcotics and muscle relaxants and tells him to go home. So a day later, he comes back to the same uh, emergency department. He's got uh, a, 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 casth a casthea, acasthea, acasthesia, acasthesia, acasthesia. <laughs> thank you. OK, I need to practice this. Acasthesia, <laughs> which is restless leg syndrome. Right, you 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 feel like twitching your legs and motor restlessness, uh, thought to be side effects of the medication. Uh, told him uh, it, uh, the physician said you ought to go to the hospital, but the patient went home. Next day he comes back, he's got muscle twitching, fever, uh, tachycardia, high high height rate, hypo, uh, heart rate, hypotension. Uh, he's admitted to the hospital. The physician's thinking uh, sepsis must have a systemic. Uh, bacterial infection or something like that. After his uh, admission, the, his mental status uh, deteriorated rapidly. He was ultimately intubated uh, on the 9th. This is now four days after his original complaint. He was referred to a, a, a neighboring hospital and they do a bunch of blood work here that basically comes back that he's got elevated, uh, it's not blood work, they, they did a lumbar puncture, he's got cerebrospinal fluid, and it comes back indicating an infection. He's got white cells and uh, a lot of protein. Um, by through nine, 10 days uh, uh, duration, from the 9th to the 19th, so now we're two weeks out at the 19th from his original presentation, no etiology for his disease is identified. Uh, it's getting more complicated. He's got lower heart rate, hypotension, muscle uh, degradation, and renal failure requiring uh, dialysis. Um, they did an MRI of his brain. Everything's fine, uh, apparently, from that. They did cultures on his cerebrospinal fluid looking for West Nile, herpes, flu, HIV. They're all negative. Finally, on the 19th, two weeks after he uh, first comes in, somebody says, maybe you should check for rabies. Uh, and they send a bunch of samples uh, to the CDC. Unfortunately, the day, uh, the day following, he died. But post-mortem, two days later, the CDC comes back and says, yes, indeed, he's got rabies antibodies. And uh, they also ultimately did an autopsy and looked at his brain. And his brain has a lot of, they got pictures of his brain here. 
It's and unbelievable, that it's brain. It does, doesn't look good. I had one of wow. my friends look at this because I don't know what to look for. But he said, oh, man, that's a mess. First of all, it's like 30% larger in weight than it should be. Uh, it's all inflamed and it's misshapen. And then they have um, uh, some pathology. Uh, one is just a, a stain of a section showing the classic diagnostic for rabies, which is Negri bodies named after their discoverer, which are little inclusions, little spots in the cytoplasm of neurons that are assembly sites for the virus. And they have another immunohistoch immunohistochemical stain, which is uh, looking for rabies antigen. And uh, you can see it's just all over this brain tissue with concentrations in neurons that would, I, I guess, correspond to Negri bodies as well. So then the interesting follow-up is, uh, so how did he get this? And they really don't know because of course by the time they could get to him um he um couldn't respond to him. by the time they could question him about exposure to rabies he couldn't uh uh respond to anything some of his contacts uh said that uh, he apparently this guy was a mechanic who worked in a farming area and he apparently um reported to them some time ago that he had seen a bat in late July after removing a tarpaulin from a tractor adjacent to his residence. So the July, August, September, October. So that's a, a little over two months, but no evidence of a bite or anything like that. And apparently there's quite a few cases like this where there's no evidence of a bite. I was thinking when I first read this that maybe this was some sort of aerosol transmission, but in particular since he first presented with respiratory symptoms. But in following up with uh, our colleague Eric Donaldson and some contacts at CDC, it sounds as if aerosol transmission of rabies is a thought to be not common at all. And probably there's some sort of other exposure that he had, even just some saliva and who knows whether he handled the bat or not and got some saliva in a cut or something like that so what about all the people who who took care of him did they have to have any prophylaxis yeah this is interesting the healthcare workers right because um they initially ordered an autopsy and nobody wanted to touch um the the corpse and do an autopsy because they were afraid of transmission and one of the messages in this is that, in, in, in fact, the uh, uh, risk of transmission, although you should take precautions, the risk of transmission, even during an autopsy, is virtually nil. Uh, you really have to be uh, bitten by a rabid uh, animal. So they say they interviewed uh, contacts, including family. This is one of the things CDC does, right? They do the epidemiology. Uh, interviewed close contacts, including family, friends, coworkers, healthcare personnel, to clarify his exposure here, uh, history and determine whether uh, post-exposure prophylaxis should be recommended. Uh, it identified no specific course of exposure. Um, and let's see, they uh, 159 contacts were counseled about potential risks. Uh, they handed out um, information. Um, I 147 of these people were healthcare providers because it was right. it was not just the pathologists at his at the hospital where he died, um, but apparently the CDC tried to arrange an autopsy at um, surrounding um, teaching hospitals in in Kentucky, Indiana, and Tennessee, and the response they got everywhere was, well, if the guy died of rabies, of rabies we're not touching him. Right. So they say two family members, two coworkers, and 14 healthcare providers were identified as having uh, been potentially exposed to saliva, and these were all recommended to get the uh, prophylaxis, uh, mm -hmm. which is a rabies vaccination. Um, and they completed the vaccination series, blah, 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 and nobody got rabies. Right. But one of the uh, editorial note uh, things is that uh, – uh, although contact with decedents with confirmed or suspected rabies can cause anxiety, no confirmed case of rabies has ever been reported among persons performing post-mortem examinations on humans or animals. They do go on to say you should take uh, some appropriate precautions. But apparently, the human-to-human -human transmission, even when you're handling somebody who's obviously uh, been seriously infected with this virus, is um, uh, 
non-existent. And there is virus present. We should say oh, that. Yeah. Boy. Right. I mean, and part of the autopsy, section. part of the autopsy is uh, removing that brain that there's yeah. this picture of, which right. is loaded. Yeah, they so, make the statement that aerosols should be minimized when you cut open the the skull. Yeah, use a handsaw instead of a power saw. So that's interesting because it doesn't, you know, it still says be careful about aerosols, even though we think they're not important. Right. You shouldn't probably breathe in. Yeah, for for a disease rabies. that's pretty much 100% lethal, you you do want to exercise an abundance of caution. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, totally the, appropriate. But, interestingly, at the same time, they say that they you don't have to... Okay, so there are some circumstances where if people are going to be routinely exposed to a lot of rabies, um, uh, they should be vaccinated uh, uh, against rabies. There, uh, obviously, Im implied in all this, there is a rabies vaccine that is a... Um, an, an inactivated virus vaccine. Um, but they say that you don't have to be uh, vaccinated against rabies in order to do autopsies on a uh, rabies victim. But I'll tell you, I'd be careful if I were doing an autopsy on somebody like this, no matter sure. what anybody said. Sure. I, think, I guess the other thing we can take away is that rare diseases are very difficult to diagnose. Yes. Yeah. That's uh, that's an important message in this. Uh, yeah, this it's it's important to note that these, um, you know, it's not the physician's fault for not picking up on this. This is a pretty freakish thing. Right, and it doesn't have really a classic rabies presentation. His first complaint was uh, respiratory problems, so there can be a prodrome that's just sort of fever and nausea and that kind of stuff. Uh, and he's missing some of the really classic things like hydrophobia. Right. Um, so, but on top of that, it's, it's a very rare, it's a very rare disease. There's only two or three cases, one or two cases of, of rabies in the U S uh, every year. So you can be a doctor your whole life and, and never see a case of yeah. this. Right. The article says, uh, including this case, there've been a total of 31 cases of human rabies in the U S uh, since 2000. So uh, 3.1 cases a year, that's... Uh... And, you know, many of those, um, you have a bite involved of some right. sort. So the patient goes to the ER, says, I was bitten, and then you get right. taken care of properly. But this, in this case, which is part of the interest, there wasn't a bite, at least a known bite. So uh, One of the problems is that, you know, some something like that, uh, the bite could have been two months ago. Yeah. Sure. Um, and it, and it, and it's, you can, I think people actually get bitten or have encounters with animals and are not even aware of it. Okay. Um, speaking of that, oh. I have a book here called Inside the Outbreaks, which, uh, was a pick some time ago on TWIV. And it relates a, this is about the Epidemic Intelligence Service. Ah, right. Relates an incident in 19, um, what year? 1951. Uh, a Dallas woman died after being bitten by a rabid insectivorous bat. So U.S. officials started getting uh, worried about bats. 1955, Kenneth Quist, a EIS officer, was assigned to help an entomologist study it. They were sent to caves in Texas to capture and ban some of the millions of Mexican free-tailed bats, trying to track where they migrated. So they went into this cave, and Quist said it was like walking into a mist. He said the bats were salivating and... So they collected bats, and they were really careful, um, worked over the Christmas holidays. January 1st, 1956, the entomologist, who was George Menzies, went home to Austin, felt feverish, began to salivate the following morning. Two days later, he died, wow. leaving a wife and two children. No one knew how he had contracted rabies since he had not been bitten. Right. So that's the origin of the uh, aerosol, right? Uh, in infection, I think. Right, um, and yet, you know, the experts say. Yeah. The CDC one says, um, although aerosol transmission is considered to be a possible bioterrorism uh, terrorism scenario by some in animal to human exposures resulting in disease, most believe that the exposure needs to be percutaneous or mucosal exposure to saliva. So the, quote, yeah. bat in the bedroom scenario has become truly difficult scenario to work through. Yeah. yeah, and it's worth noting that a lot of these bats are very, very small animals that um, would make a very, very small bite that might not even really be noticeable at all. Right. Right. So even in the case of the entomologist, um, we don't know that it's an aerosol. 
I mean, it seems pretty likely in that case because he probably would have noticed if he'd been bitten because he was attuned to it. But, um, but even so, you know, can you be certain that you weren't bitten by a bat? Man, there's got to be bat saliva just all over a cave like that, and you oh, can sure. get it in a mucous membrane and sure. bingo. I would guess, yeah, yeah, something like that. Right, so you think the medical students nice. will dig that? They'll dig it, yeah. Especially if you, why don't you just play this episode of Twib for them? <laughs> oh. Yeah, they'll love it. Well, you know, of course the, of course the, you know, you don't want to take up too much time with this, but you get, you get really, you get really sucked in, and the and the students love that kind of yeah. stuff. So. Well, you know, you uh, have a, a lecture, and this could take up the whole lecture, but you don't want yeah. to do that. But no, I think right. they'll like it. Sure. All right, let's do a few emails. Uh, the first one is from James. Um, I'm just writing to clarify my question about the production of flu vaccine. If one of the other seasonal strains was removed, as there seemed to be a bit of confusion about the point of it. So I guess we read an email of his a while ago, and he was talking about how you could make more flu if you could eliminate one right. of the vaccines. And I, I think we, we did, uh, in fact, uh, misinterpret his uh, email. So this is a good clarification. Right. He writes, as I understand it, one of the biggest holdups in seasonal flu vaccine production is getting enough eggs of the right quality to grow the vaccine in. This is effectively a fixed amount that gets split three ways between the three seasonal strains. So this would mean for 100 units of possible production, each strain gets 33.3 units made. What if WHO decided that swine origin H1N1 had not only displaced the previous seasonal H1N1, but also one of the other seasonal strains, and thus the next seasonal vaccine for whichever hemisphere is next, only needs a bivalent vaccine instead of the previous trivalent vaccine? To my understanding, this would mean that for 100 units of available production, you could make 50 units of each strain. This would have two immediate advantages. Either you can make the same number of seasonal flu vaccines as in previous in less time, or for the same amount of time, you can get more doses. The main logistical advantage of this would be you could vaccinate more people faster than is currently possible. This, of course, would require the WHO to decide that swine origin H1N1 has displaced two seasonal strains, which seems to be unlikely from my outside view. Okay. Well, it turns well, out to be exactly right. Since this uh, email came in, we had this discussion about how uh, both viruses are circulating. Right. So swine origin and H3N2 are circulating. As, and the, so the next right. vaccine, as we have said, is H1N1, H3N2, and influenza B. Right. So we've gotten rid of one, the seasonal H1N1. But he raises an interesting point, and I understand now what he's, yeah. uh, what he's talking about, that uh, if, you, uh, if there were a serious problem with uh, limiting eggs, that would uh, be an interesting consideration. Right. right. The, the difficulty is twofold. I mean, first of all, it's a sort of a Clint Eastwood issue. Do you feel lucky? Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, right. the, and, the, and secondly, you know, the time lag on these vaccines is considerable. Um, it's months and, and it, you've got to ramp up production in the springtime so you can vaccinate people in the late summer and fall and, and into the winter. Um, so you're ramping up production at a time when you don't have complete information on what's going to be circulating. Um, and uh, obviously, if you pick wrong, you're really hosed. And um, if you if you were to eliminate one strain um, early on, you might be able to increase production. But the the other issue that comes up is it turns out in most flu seasons that is not the rate limiting step in vaccinating the population. The problem is uptake of the vaccine. Hmm. So uh, making more vaccine would not necessarily uh, um, accomplish much so are we going to uh get to a point anytime soon where we have a cell culture vaccine instead of the egg grown vaccine because that would eliminate this yep i hope so <laughs> i i believe one is approved in the eu um so it's just a matter of time i think yeah it just needs to be tested and here in the u.s I, i'm sure we will yeah because it seems silly to use eggs doesn't it right it does. I, I just saw an article i don't know where there's an egg shortage in the U.S. Did any of you see that? No. Quality eggs are short in the U.S. I don't know where it was from. So yeah, well, there, you, was, there was the the recall just recently of. Uh, but what, those were you're talking about eggs for growing flu in, or in I'm just talking about eggs. I don't even know if it had. There, any. It turns out there are actually two different supply chains. Okay. Um. So that was probably for eating. 
Yeah. So the the ones for eating, there was this recall of a, a billion eggs or something that. Uh, uh, there were salmonella contaminated. Or exactly. Something, is that right. Yeah, okay. they were salmonella contaminated, and probably most of them have been eaten by now. Um, but they're officially recalling. Can you gobs, can gobs you recall eggs. them after you've eaten them? Can you give them um, back? Well, I don't know. I, I I could probably put some in an envelope that way, but. Uh, <laughs> Let's move on down to John's email. Dear Twivers, thanks for this wonderful podcast. I found two of your stories in Twiv82 really fascinating. I wanted to ask a couple of questions. Forgive me if these are dumb questions. I'm a computer scientist with little formal biology background, so I may be missing all kinds of stuff. Never. Never dumb. First, from your dengue story, I was trying to get my head around antibody-dependent enhancement of infection. So let's review that. You get infected with dengue. There are four serotypes. You make antibodies to serotype one, say. If you get reinfected with serotype two, you make a memory response to serotype one. Those antibodies bind the virus. They don't neutralize its infectivity, and they help the virus get into macrophages, and that's a problem. Right. You get worse disease. So he goes on, how is ADE related to original antigenic sin? Is it just a worse variant of it? In both cases, you get infected with strain number one of the virus. You develop an immune response to it. And then when you're exposed to strain number two, you respond as though it were strain number one. In the original antigenic sin case, you produce relatively ineffective antibodies. So you don't get as effective an immune response as you should. In the ADE case, the ineffective antibodies provide an opportunity for the virus to gain entry to macrophages via the FC receptor along with failing to neutralize the virus. Is that basically right or have I misunderstood? Sounds right to me. Yeah, except that in the case of original antigenic sin, which is what happens or it's thought to happen with influenza, the antibodies that are made to a previously infecting virus don't don't hurt you, right? They don't right. help the virus get into macrophages as is the case with dengue. But they're both memory responses, essentially. What I'm trying to understand is why this doesn't happen all the time. I mean, if viral infection is still present when my antibody response starts ramping up, shouldn't I start having virions getting bound to by some of those early antibodies at a level where they're not neutralized, but they can get inside the macrophages using the FC receptor? Perhaps most viruses just can't benefit from being engulfed by the macrophage, but dengue can. Well, I think the point is that the antibodies don't, you don't need a lot of antibodies to neutralize viruses. In some cases, you just need a few per virion. And it depends on the virus. Right. So, you know, if there's a match between the antibody and the virus, it'll get neutralized. Right. It's kind of an oversimplification, but that's probably what's going on. Then he says, how is the T cell response involved in all this? If I already have cytotoxic T cells that recognize what infected cells look like, shouldn't they be killing the infected macrophages? Or maybe that's why the second bout of dengue makes you so sick. Well, nobody knows, I think. But they're still trying to figure out the antibody dependent enhancement. Right. Looks like we have a mouse model to do that. So, as far as T cells goes, we don't know, but that's a good idea that maybe T cell mediated killing of infected macrophages exacts, exacerbates the situation. Sure. Could be. Then, uh, after you've had the second bout of dengue, assuming you survive, do you end up with antibodies that protect you from both strains you've been exposed to, or are you stuck with the antibody response to the first strain? Well, the answer is you have antibodies to the two strains you've been infected with, but there are two more strains that can get you, and right. you can still get uh, serious disease, so you're right. not protected. And that's one of the problems with a vaccine. You have to have all four present, but um, it you know it's difficult because if even if you have antibodies against a specific serotype, it may be a race between them neutralizing that virus and the other antibodies coding it and getting it into macrophages. Right, and partial immunity is worse than none. Right. Second, when you were talking about the different MHC molecules associated with people whose bodies control HIV for a long time without getting sick, I was curious about whether these molecules were associated with different levels of autoimmune disease. On one side, I'd expect MHC molecules that don't bind well to many self antigens to be less likely to cause autoimmune disease. On the other side, I'd expect a wider range of antigens that could be bound by MHC to be associated with more ways for something to go wrong, leading to your immune system 
attacking healthy host cells? Or does the process of selection in the thymus keep those MHC differences from having much effects? Well, this is a good question. We had this question from a, a, another uh, email before. And I think, yeah, basically when you hear a scientist say that's a good question, that's another way of saying, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> so I think we came to the conclusion before that we really didn't know whether there was uh, uh, any greater propensity for autoimmune disease in people with those um, MHC characteristics. Yeah, these are these are some of the smartest dumb questions I've heard in a really long uh, time. Yeah, this guy, he says he's a computer scientist? Yeah. Uh, he's, well, he must be a hell of a computer scientist because <laughs> he's a good virologist as well. These are good questions. So the, the last one, yes, that's what you would expect is that if you have MHCs that can recognize a broader range of HIV peptides, you may be more likely to have autoimmune disease. Perfectly you, reasonable expectation. Yeah, if you go back to the way the education of the uh, T cells occurs in the thymus, that would make sense. But whether or not those elite controllers, those HLA B57 patients have a higher incidence of autoimmune disease, I don't know the answer to that. Okay, the last one hmm, is from Jim. The July-August 2010 issue of Discover Magazine addresses faulty research in an article by David Friedman called The Streetlight Effect, which is based on his book entitled Wrong. The New York Times had a column that discussed this book and included the following comment. Mr. Friedman, the author of Wrong, is a science and business journalist. He points out that most expert wisdom, especially about health issues, isn't just sometimes but nearly always ultimately proved wrong. He is diligent about explaining the disconcerting reasons why this is so. He examines how the sausage that is major health studies is actually made. It's not pretty. Mr. Friedman observes the way that very small and hence unreliable surveys, often based solely on animal testing, are used to make extravagant, extravagant claims about cancer or our diets. He notes how scientists discard data that doesn't fit their theses. He talks about measurement errors and the academic pressures of publish or perish. And then Jim says, his concerns and those addressed by the cancer doctor about journalism seems to present issues for anyone interested in a research career might need to know about. What do you think, Alan? Well, um, there, there are a couple of things going on here. I have not read the book, um, but it sounds like the argument that Friedman is making is that um, small studies get blown out of proportion and, and used to, uh, you know, to, to sell particular products. And that's true, but it's not the fault of the scientists doing the original small studies in most cases. If you read these studies that are done in animal systems, you see that they are absolutely larded with caveats about how this doesn't tell us anything about what's going on in humans. It just hints at maybe the experiment we ought to do. Um, so unfortunately, that doesn't streamline very well when you've got uh, you know 300 word column and a headline to make your point. <laughs> um, so uh, the other thing is you you get folks who latch onto these things and try to make a quick buck um and you get ridiculous myths like uh you know people going around saying shark cartilage will cure cancer um so i i think that may be kind of where this is going um and i the only long-term solution to this is a scientifically literate public. And unfortunately, we've just not been able to accomplish that, um, certainly not in this country in the yeah. past 50 years. Well, it's, it's difficult for people to know exactly what scientists do. He says, for example, uh, scientists discard data that don't fit their theses. Well, I don't do that, and I know a lot of scientists that don't. So maybe a few do, and he's heard about them, and now he generalizes it to everyone. And yeah, there's a whole there's a whole science of data analysis as well that can that can be misinterpreted. Um, so I'm as I say, I have not read the book. I'm not going to judge the quality of the book, but I I believe this is making an old argument that kind of floats around um, that uh, you know our our clinical studies and our health studies uh, certainly if you look at something like the field of nutrition, which seems to come out with contradictory claims every month. Um, that's, uh, it's a product of the limitations of the way the science is being done. And I think the scientists themselves are usually pretty frank about that. But, um, if the public doesn't understand how science works, and that's really the problem, it's not that you need all the specialized knowledge in all of these areas. It's just that you need to understand how the process works. Right. Um, 
and if you don't understand that, you're going to be um, you're you're going to be uh, uh, taken for a ride. Right. Yeah. What, what, so science education is really important. What What does he think we should do as scientists? Should we discard science? Is that the idea? I don't know. I do. No, you haven't read the book, of course. No, I haven't read the book, and um, I, I at this point I'm hesitant to comment on any you know any more of the argument because I don't know what the, exactly yeah, what the sure sure. Is. But anyway, that's sort of an open question. Uh, what yeah. should we do? But I think science education is really the answer. Yep, and uh, I wouldn't throw out the science. I mean, you got to keep doing the science. Sure. Um, and it's just important that uh, everybody out there uh, knows how to how to look at it. Right. Yeah, and That's... science is ultimately the only way we can really know anything. Right. Well, you know, we feel that way, but there's some other ways. I mean, <laughs> that science isn't the answer to everything, right? Certain. No, it's not the it's not the answer to everything, but if you want to really be sure that your answer you know, reflect something that's transsubjective. Um, this is the tool that you yeah. go to. Yeah, I agree. I just don't want people to think that. No, no. If you it. want, if you if you <laughs> want to have a subjective opinion about something, then you can have a subjective opinion about it. Yeah. But the the uh, strength of science is that you know gravity works no matter uh, what religion you are. That's right. All right, let's do a few picks of the week, Rich. Uh, I'm really anxious to do this one. Have you read this, Vincent? The Great Bridge, the epic story of the building of the Brooklyn Bridge by not. David McCullough. No. So this qualifies as a uh, TWIV pick because it's basically an engineering story. This is a, just a, a a terrific book. And um, are you, are you, now you're a sort of upper Manhattan, is that right? Yeah, way at the north end, yeah. Yeah. We're well, after I read this, sometime after I read this book, I went and uh, walked across the Brooklyn Bridge and back, and it gave me a real appreciation for it. The Brooklyn Bridge was one of the first structures of its kind um, built uh, across a fairly large body of water like that. So there's a lot of engineering that uh, goes along with this, and a lot of history of engineering. But one of the most interesting parts is how they built the towers because they um, – built them with these things they called they're, they're, the towers go into the water so they built them with these things called caissons which is like a, a giant metal pan that must be taller than people have to be able to when it's inverted people have to be able to uh, stand up underneath it so this big metal pan as big as the base of the bridge is inverted and stuffed into the water sunk into the water with air trapped underneath right hmm. And down onto the uh, bed of the river so that people can stand up on the riverbed inside this pan and then dig and through airlocks, the uh, material that they dig out is uh, ejected and they slowly but surely sink the pan in the riverbed as they dig it out. Which right? led to an important physiological discovery. Bingo. The bends. Mm -hmm. As they got deeper and deeper, these people came up and started experiencing what we now know is the bends or decompression sickness because they get, they spend a long time under pressure, you get nitrogen dissolved in your blood. And then if you release that pressure, all of a sudden it comes out as bubbles and they collect in your joints and that gives you the bends and it can kill you. And as a fact, the guy who was the major engineer on this, uh, Robley, I forget his first name. Um, actually wound up dying of the bends. I think that's how it worked. I know he got the bends. I, I read this book a long time ago. But it's a fantastic story. A very a, a terrific read. It's got all this engineering stuff in it and the discovery of the bends on the top of it. So read that book and then go walk across the bridge again. Yeah, when I went uh, under the bridge on a Circle Line tour, they told a good story about it. It sounded great. There was a lot of politics involved too. I don't know if yes, you listened to that. Yes, a lot of oh yeah, David McCullough, right? He's uh, he's narrated a bunch of uh, 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 public television uh, films and mm -hmm. stuff, documentaries. Did he do the Civil War? I think he might have. Um, great, he's got a great uh, broadcast voice, and he uh, is a terrific writer. So this is cool. this is a great read. Excellent. Thanks. I'm going to get it. Alan Dove. Well, my pick of the week is uh, humorous. Um, at least I find it so. It's called NCBI ROFL. 
Um, the NCBI is the uh, National Center for Biological Information or Biotechnology Information. Uh, it's the, the people who run PubMed. Um, and NCBI ROFL is a, magaz is a blog um, maintained on the Discover Magazine site um, where they go and just pull amusing things out of the literature. <laughs> um, <laughs> That's funny. So this uh, this has uh, you know some of the stuff you look at you say okay yeah haha ha. and some of it is is pretty funny um, but they're all <laughs> they all have citations from the literature on studies that that have actually been done um, so you can read about uh, the importance of prairie voles in alcoholism research um, and how to get a prairie vole drunk uh, or emotional and uncontrolled eating styles and chocolate chip cookie consumption um, and. Uh, it's one of the things in my RSS reader that. Uh, oh, this looks great! This yeah, funny. there's a lot of good stuff. Good. I got to, uh, I got to make this a regular, regular read. Yeah, it's it's a little like the um, Annals of Improbable Research, but it's strictly uh, related to PubMed. I'm going to bookmark this right now. Nice. Yeah, I didn't know about that. Very good. All right, my pick is a blog post. It is in the blog called Small Things Considered, which we have picked. Uh, a long time ago on TWIV, but this is a specific post by our friend Welkin Johnson. It's called Dr. Rouse's Prize-Winning Chicken, and Rouse is Peyton Rouse, the discoverer of Rouse sarcoma virus and the first solid tumor-causing virus. And it turns out that September 1st was the 100-year anniversary of uh, publishing oh. the paper on... Uh, Finding that a filtered extract from the tumor, a solid tumor, a sarcoma from a single Plymouth Rock hen could make new tumors when injected into healthy chickens. So he gives a very nice uh, historical account of how that happened and what it led to today. So check it out. Welkin writes really well, and it's a great story. Thanks to Dr. Rouse and his prize-winning hen. I have a nice. Of a Looks great. I haven't. Uh, I haven't actually read this, but I think I actually read the original paper, and my recollection is that he passaged this thing, and it got more and more virulent as he passaged it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, why I don't know. Of course, whether the, whether he actually selected it, it's almost as if he selected for a virus that carried the oncogene. You know. Well, it turns out that Rouse was very lucky that he isolated a non-defective virus. Right. Because chickens are full of these viruses and most of the transforming ones that arise are defective. The right. a lot of the genome is replaced with an oncogene, but the virus then needs a helper virus in order to multiply. Right. But his was not. So he's very lucky because it may have taken him longer to uh to do this if he had a defective virus. But as we know, luck favors the prepared mind, right? That's yes. right. Oh, well, this looks great. Yeah, it's a nice uh, article by Welkin. And that will do it for another TWIV. You can listen to TWIV on iTunes at the Zunes Marketplace and with Stitcher Radio on your smartphone and even with Double Twist, which is an app that you can use on an Android phone or on Macs, PCs, or Linux running machines. You can always play everything at twiv.tv where we keep all of our show notes. And if you are new to TWIV and like it, go on to iTunes and write a review. And that helps us helps to keep us on the front page of the medicine podcast section. TWIV is part of microbeworld.org, sciencepodcasters.org, and promednetwork.com, where you can find other high quality science content. As always, send us your questions and comments to TWIV at twiv.tv. Now, if you've listened to TWIV 96, which was making viral DNA, go on back to the episode and I've posted the video just today. So if you want to see me and Dixon and Rich talking about DNA, uh, go over there and download the video. Next week, I will be at ICAC. Now, ICAC is not something that makes you throw up. It is a <laughs> meeting. It is a very big meeting on infectious diseases that attracts many, many, many clinicians. And it's being held in Boston. I will be there with ASM and we'll be doing an inside the meeting look at ICAC. So I'll be going around showing you what a meeting like that is like, talking with some of the speakers and 
maybe looking at some posters. So t- stay tuned for that one. Alan, thank you for coming back. Always a pleasure. Actually, I don't know why I say thank you. You never went anywhere, right? That's right. I'm just sitting here. Thanks for joining us. <laughs> Alan <laughs> is at alandove.com. And Rich, thank you. Always a pleasure. It's University great fun. of Florida at Gainesville, home of the Fighting Gators. Is it still hot down there? Uh, it's starting to cool off. It's uh, We're getting towards the end of summer. So you're so. getting in the 90s, huh? Uh, oh, no, we're in the 80s right now. I'm, uh, oh, actually, says, my little weather bug says it's 91. But, okay. Well, well, you'll, you'll have to light up some books to keep warm. Uh, thanks. Yes, thanks a lot. Really, hey. I'm trying, not to, I'm trying not to think about it. You have been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.